This video is brought to you by Magic Spoon. If you've watched my other channel, <laughs> this is not turning out well. This video is brought to you by Magic Spoon. If you've watched my other channel, Business Blaze, you know that a few times I've gone on about how much I love cereal. It's shocking. I mean, it's cereal, it's good, it's super good. Who doesn't like cereal? Well, the problem with cereal is it contains an abundance of sugar that I just don't need in my life. I don't need to be fat, and the cereal would make it so easy. But anyway, Magic Spoon came along and we're like, yo Simon, check out this delicious cereal. It's got loads of protein, and there's only three net grams of carbs per serving, and only 110 calories, which is not a lot. And look, I don't know much about protein, and carbs and all of that stuff, but I do know, let's eat more protein, let's not eat so many carbs, let's not eat so much sugar, and also, this tastes super good. Now, like, like a normal person, I do eat this with milk, but I also quite enjoy just snacking on it. Also, this is the frosted flavor, just like frosted sugar. I'm very much looking forward to cocoa because that's my favorite flavor. And then I've also got coming up, I think this is blueberry, yes and this is fruity. So, looking forward to all of these, but that's for later. I'm gonna stop eating cereal. It's amazing tasting, it tastes like it's got loads of sugar in it, but it doesn't. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, low-carb, GMO-free, all of that good stuff. Anyway, click the link below or go to magicspoon.com forward slash brain food to grab a variety pack and try it out. Use promo code brain food and you get free shipping, plus, 100% happiness guarantee, so if you don't like it, you get your money back, and let's get into it. If you've ever won a competition, chances are high that you want to do it again. So, if someone offers you an edge, temptation is high to use it, no matter the cost. May it be a drink from the gods or an injection by your coach. Over the centuries, there were lots of things that people used to enhance their performance. And enter the picture, steroids! But as with all drugs, these also come with some not so desired effects, which brings us to the topic of the hour. Why do steroids make your ball smaller? And does the same thing happen to a woman's ovaries? To understand the answer to those questions, we must first look at exactly what steroids are and how they affect the body. To begin with, steroids are a part of the huge family of lipids. We know them best for their function as storage for energy, but without lipids, not a one of us would be sitting here as one of their main functions is as structural components in the cell membrane. But lipids are also used as molecules which transfer signals signals in the body. For the topic at hand, we are only going to look at one molecule, cholesterol. While many people have only heard of cholesterol for potential in clogging your arteries until you go belly up, among other things, it's also the starting substance if you want to make a certain class of hormones. Steroid hormones, to be exact. Hormones are nothing else but chemical messengers your body is using to control organ function and metabolism. Cholesterol can be metabolized into different steroid hormones. Depending on where in your body the reaction takes place, different types of steroid hormones are synthesized. In the cortex of the suprarenal glands, the ovaries, the placenta, or in the testicles. And yes, We'll get back to your ball soon, so sit tight. So which hormones derive from cholesterol? There are the glucocorticoids. You might know its most important representative, the stress hormone cortisol. Then there are the mineralocorticoids, which regulate the salt and water balance in your body. Their primary representative is aldosterone. Then, and drum roll please, there are the male and female sex steroids. Primary function of the sex steroids or sex hormones is the development of sexual characteristics they basically decide your sex in your mother's womb and then hit quite hard again during puberty. But what has all of this got to do with doping? Well, in a word, that's testosterone. Testosterone as the primary androgen or male sex hormone has two main effects, virilization and anabolism. It is responsible for maturing the male sex organs before birth and the appearance of the secondary sex characteristics during puberty. But one of its effects is also the growth of muscle mass and strength. That's also, of course, the reason why in sports there are often different sports leagues for men and women. Before a child hits puberty, there is no real significant sex difference in athletic performance, but as circulating testosterone rises in males, so does their physical advantages in strength, speed, and endurance. These account for at least an 8-12% ergogenic advantage in men. 
Okay, and this all brings us back to your balls. The observation that there is a connection between certain characteristics and behaviors and the testicles is very old. First castration of cattle and sheep took place during the Neolithic period when humans first started farming. Fast forward to the end of the 19th century and the British physiologist and neurologist Charles Edward Brown Seguard started to self-inject a secretion from the testicles of freshly killed guinea pigs. He argued that these auto-injections resulted in a rejuvenation body and an increase in strength. Although the amount of testosterone in these injections was probably too small to show any effects, he was essentially the first human trying to dope himself with anabolic steroids. The German physician and pharmacologist Ernst Lacker was already part of a group who first described the female sex hormone estrogen. Next, he successfully isolated testosterone from the testicles of a bull in 1935. From here, the misuse of testosterone in professional sports started around the mid-20th century by Russian weightlifters. During the 1954 World Weightlifting Championships in Vienna, Austria, John Ziegler, a doctor accompanying the U.S. team, managed to get the secret out of the USSR's team doctor over some vodkas, of course. Back in the U.S., he started to experiment with testosterone, first trying it out on himself, then on some athletes. Accounts of the early success vary. Some say testosterone had no effect. Others say that they gained a lot more strength than was expected from their training regimen. The doc kept on experimenting and started to develop a synthetic substance that was similar to testosterone but without its negative side effects, or at least lessened the side effects. The drug was marketed in 1958 under the name Dianabol and was intended to be used on severely debilitated patients like burn victims where it could be used to help build up muscles with only a minimum of activity. But dogs eat also started some of his weightlifters on the new drug. As the results on patients were great, his intention was to see what the drug could do to healthy, well-conditioned athletes. The doses regimen he used was very low compared to what athletes used later on, but still, the results were outstanding. From there, the abuse of anabolic steroids spread first in professional sports, but from the 1980s also into the general population, either to improve athletic performance or simply often used by young men to improve personal appearance. In fact, according to the United States, State's National Institute on Drug Abuse, the biggest group misusing steroids are male non-athlete weightlifters in their 20s or 30s. But why is it so bad to use these drugs? Well, to begin with, people who misuse steroids often use dosages that are 10 to 100 times higher than the doses which are usually prescribed for medical conditions. As side effects are usually dosage dependent, that makes things even worse. Long-term effects include kidney problems, up to kidney failure, liver damage and tumors, enlarged heart, high blood pressure, and changes in blood cholesterol, all of which increase the risk of stroke and heart attack, even in young people. And if this wasn't bad enough, there's also an increased risk of blood clots. In men, sperm count also decreases, they go bald, develop breasts, have an increased risk of prostate cancer, and of course, then there are the balls. So, let's take a look at your balls, shall we? Why do they shrink when using steroids? Hormones in our bodies are very tightly controlled. For testosterone, that means that first, very specific things must happen in your brain for them to be released. The hypothalamus is one of the most important regulatory centers for certain metabolic processes. It all starts with gonadotropin-releasing hormone, GnRH, being secreted there. GnRH then stimulates the release of follicle stimulation hormone, FSH, from another part of your brain, the pituitary gland. FSH affects the testicles, so they secrete testosterone. Once testosterone is released, it reports back to your brain, and your brain knows to tone down the production of GnRH and FSH. That means if there is enough testosterone circulating in your body, your brain stops telling your balls to produce it. So it's basically use it or lose it. If there is always enough testosterone in your body because you put it in your body artificially by some means, your testicles, not needing to do this, start shrinking. But what about women? Does testosterone even have an effect on them? And if they use it, do their ovaries shrink as well? First things first, yes, testosterone has the same effects on women as it does have on men. It's just that the ladies' testosterone level is much, much lower than it is in men, usually around 15 times lower to be precise. Also, if you thought that sex hormones are only produced in your sex organs, well, wrong again. Testosterone and estrogen are both synthesized in the adrenal glands to a lesser degree, of course, and estrogen is also 
also produced by fat tissue. Even if a woman takes testosterone, her ovaries still have a job to do, so they don't start shrinking. But think back to what are the two functions of testosterone, anabolism and virilization. So the women will gain muscle mass, but her body will also become more male-like in certain other aspects. Common side effects in women taking steroids include growth of facial hair or excess body hair, decreased breast size, male pattern baldness, changes in or even stopping the menstrual cycle, enlarged clitoris, and deepened voice. Some of these effects are permanent, so they persist even when the woman stops taking testosterone. Incidentally, one more side effect of testosterone we haven't talked about affects specifically young people taking testosterone. If you are a teen and taking testosterone before your growth spurt, you will end up with stunted height, or even if you only start taking it after the growth spurt, your height will still be lessened. As to why, when the sex hormones hit a certain level, it also signals the body that it is time to stop growing. If you raise that hormone level artificially earlier than your body would have done, your body also reads this signal in this and just stops growing. Unfortunately, this is also a permanent effect because stopping to grow means that a part of your bones, which was cartilage until that point, reforms into bone material. But this cartilage is necessary for a bone to keep growing. Once the ossification, making cartilage into bone, is done, there is no way back, and even if the use of testosterone is stopped, there will still be no more growth spurts. And now for some bonus facts. Women suffering from polycystic ovary syndrome are overrepresented in elite sports. Even though you might have never heard of this condition, it is the most common endocrine disorder among women aged 18 to 44 and the most common cause of infertility due to lack of ovulation. Polycystic ovary syndrome leads to mild hyperandrogenism. There is a hormonal imbalance with a little more testosterone in women with this condition than in the general female population. Even though their testosterone levels are still much lower than the testosterone levels in men, Men, this mild increase in some cases is enough to give these women an edge over other women in sports competitions, thus leading to them being overrepresented in athletics. The clitoris and the head of the penis start out from the same tissue during embryogenesis. If you're very observant, you can see or feel that when a woman is sexually aroused, the clitoris, as well as the small labia, are also swelling similar to the erectile tissue in the penis. Unsurprisingly from this, the tissues have a similar origin. Testosterone has an effect on the clitoris, and in the presence of higher than usual levels of testosterone in a woman, the clitoris becomes enlarged, sometimes extremely so, strongly resembling a small penis in some extreme cases. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please smash that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to check out our fantastic sponsor, Magic Spoon. There is a link to them below. And as always, thank you for watching.